most unstressful. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the third presentation of Boris FX Virtual SIGGRAPH 2020. We have an exciting presentation today. We're going to break down Mocha Pro in VFX workflow with Mary Poplin. Uh, before we get started, I um, just want to let everyone know about our new product, the Boris FX Suite, which is everything we sell in an annual subscription. That is a multi-host Sapphire, um, multi-host Continuum, Mocha Pro standalone and plug-in, um, Silhouette standalone, Silhouette Paint plug-in, and the brand new Optics all in one annual subscription. Regularly priced $12.95 per year. It is on sale for SIGGRAPH for $9.95. Um, you can use the code SIG20 um, at checkout to take advantage of this great deal. Um, and one lucky winner at today's live stream will be um, getting a annual subscription to the Boris Effect Suite for free. So um, how you enter to win a subscription to the Boris FX suite is to go to borisfxlive.com. There is a little form at the bottom that you can fill out into your email, and we will pick from um, today's viewers, um, and somebody will be getting a whole bunch of uh, free software. So really cool stuff. So if you're watching on YouTube or watching on Facebook, go ahead and pop over to borisfxlive.com and enter to win. Um, after Mary's presentations, we have two more coming up today that will round out the day at 4.30 um, Eastern Time and 1.30 on the West Coast. We are going to um, be hanging out with Brendan O'Neill from Bonfire, who's going to break down his Unreal slash Flame compositing workflow that he uses on his on some of the commercials he works on over at Bonfire. Really cool stuff. Brendan's definitely on the cutting edge and an amazing artist, so that's definitely a must-see. That is at 4.30 on the East Coast and 1.30 on the West Coast. And then closing out the day, we have John Dickinson, Director of Motion Graphics for Boris FX, showing a sneak peek at Particle Illusion 2021, some new features like support for 3D camera um, in Particle Illusion 2021. That is coming up at 6 o'clock on the East Coast and 3 o'clock on the West Coast. So definitely two more great presentations coming up after Mary's Mocha Pro for VFX Workshop. That we are going to begin right now. Hello, Miss Poplin. How are you? Hi, Brian. I'm great. You know, we're uh, all weathering this together. Good to see you. I <laughs> wish we were all in person at SIGGRAPH like we should be, but uh, we will make do as always. Yeah. Well, um, all right. Well, let me us. go ahead and get... <laughs> Sorry, we all talked Hello? over each other. Uh, let me let me just introduce joining us joining us as a as another guest on our esteemed panel, Mr. Ross Shane, Chief Product Officer for Mocha. Um, hey, Ross, how you doing? I'm doing good, and uh, I think Mary's probably glad that I'm not uh, dragging her around at uh, various <laughs> uh, bars at a trade show this year. So, yeah. but yeah. great to see you guys. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, before Maya. we get started, before we get started, everybody, please like, subscribe, and share. Let us know you're out there. Say hello. Let us know where you're from. Feel free to ask any questions in the chat. Um, we love to see that people are watching. So go ahead and like, subscribe, and share the feeds. Um, we have Ross here. Um, we have Mary, and we have a bunch of our um, friends at Boris Effects that are monitoring the chats in the background. So go ahead and ask the questions, and we'll sneak them in live and and get your questions answered on air. Okay, I'm done. Let's. Let's go, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll try not to talk over you next time. All right, guys. Yeah. So um, I'm Mary Poplin, obviously, and um, I'm going to show you a little bit about Mocha. And definitely, Ross, I am happy to not be walking all over creation, um, going to various dive bars. Come Although on, dive bars are fun. <laughs> Ross, loves, Ross you know, loves to walk. <laughs> it's true. He does. Um, it is fun. You're right. Um, all right. So uh, we're going to get started a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit about Mocha in general. Um, for those of you that ha are unfamiliar with Mocha or a little bit familiar with Mocha, um, Mocha was created a while ago. And one of the things that it was created for uh, it was originally a research project, but then it got used for things like Harry Potter to put things like portraits on the wall. And that was one of the most uh, major first uses of Mocha. But Mocha is a planar tracker. And so what it does is it's actually a texture tracker. It follows a pattern of pixels as those pixels move through the scene. And you can use that data to do all sorts of things, including screen replacements, which is like our bread and butter, but also things like motion graphics, um, 
things like tracking for visual effects that you wouldn't be able to really do with a camera tracker very well. And because we're a planar tracker, we split everything up into planes, which means you track one plane at a time. So that's what the surface tool does, and you define that with a spline, and that's how you track your object. Now we get used for set extensions. We get used in for invisible VFX all the time. And you can see Mocha in just about every major, you know, TV show and movie that is around. So um, a lot of times people don't even realize that they're looking at it, you know, and I think some of these shots are a really good example of that. Like obviously for things like Ghost Rider, yeah, okay, we know that's visual effects. But for things like sky replacements and building replacements or screen replacements, people often don't even realize that's what they're looking at. Um, now, I'm going to talk a little bit today about some of the new things that we have in Mocha, or well, newer, um, and also we'll talk a little bit about techniques for tracking. So, let's go ahead and get started on this. Um, I'm going to just mention one really quickly. This is a set extension, and I'm going to show you a little bit about how to do something that's similar to that technique, if not 3D projection. All right. So let's start talking a little bit about perspective tracking. So in Mocha, we can let me just go ahead and turn this off. Um, so here's our original shot. We've got this lady walking through a uh, tunnel and we want to replace the graffiti on the wall. Um, we're gonna end up tracking this. And for those of you that are Mocha veterans, you might realize that this shot is kind of tough. And one of the reasons this shot is kind of tough is because the plane breaks the forward plane of the camera. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and add, I'll just show you what the render looks like, we're going to add this very fancy unicorn graffiti. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to track in Mocha, and Mocha is going to track this in perspective on the wall. So let's go ahead and click Mocha. If you want to add Mocha to your shot, you can either go over here to your effects panel and you can type in Mocha Pro or you can go to effect, excuse me, you can select your layer, go to Effect, and you can go to Boris Effects Mocha right here and add Mocha Pro. All right. Now, what that will do is that will add it as a plugin. Mocha also runs as a standalone. Mocha also supports OFX um, programs like Nuke, um, and it also supports Avid Media Composer and programs like Premiere. So, you can. Use Mocha in just about any host. We're going to use it in After Effects for this, but the workflow is the same no matter what host you are in, which is to say you apply your effect, and inside of your effect panel will be either a little checkbox that says Mocha or this very shiny Mocha button. And we're going to click Mocha. And what that will do is that will launch Mocha. Let's go ahead and go to our selected layer here. And inside of Mocha, you can start tracking your objects. I want to talk a little bit about some of the techniques that we can use to track this. Let's actually turn our track wall on and to set this to none for a second. All right, and what we wanna do is we wanna do two things in order to track this shot. Now, I'm not gonna track this whole shot for you because this cake is already baked for you, but what I will do is I'll show you how to get started. So if you wanna start tracking in Mocha, a lot of times what people will do is they'll just take a primitive tool and they'll just draw it around the area that they wanna track. This is not quite what you wanna do because as you can see, we have her shoulder here, we have the wall here and the ground here. But what Mocha is, is Mocha is a planar tracker. Okay, that means we want to track one plane at a time when we are tracking. So I want to take my surface tool and I want to align my surface tool to this wall a little bit. And that will give me a good idea of whether or not we're going to track this correctly. Okay, now the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to take my shape and I'm going to define the area that we want to track, which is this wall here. But if you notice, our wall is broken by her shoulder plane. And also when we track, we have to worry about, I mean, when we uh, composite, we're gonna have to worry about her shoulder as well. And I could probably crank the saturation up on here and pull a key, but I might not get great results. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to zoom in and draw a shape around her shoulder. Now, what I also want to show you is that we've got a new tool, uh, well, newer, cause it's not, it's not new in this, this most recent release, but it's very, recent um, is this magnetic tool and what the magnetic tool does is it follows an edge so that you don't have to draw this by hand and you can click and drag um, to create an, a hand-drawn spline as well so you can either do the magnetic tool or you can do a hand-drawn spline or if you click and hold down while you are uh, using the magnetic tool you can also create a line that is hand-drawn now that will create the shape for you and you don't have to create it 
by hand. Normally, for older versions of Mocha, you would come in here with an X-Spline tool and you'd have to click and trace this arm and hope that you got it correct, you know, and then zoom in and correct it. And that takes a little bit longer, but with the magnetic tool, you can make complex shapes really, really quickly and easily. Now, we're gonna call this arm track and roto, okay? And then we're gonna call this wall track two. But here's the thing, when we're tracking, we wanna make sure that this arm track, and I'll just go ahead and turn a mask on so you can see what we're doing. We wanna make sure this arm track is in the layer above the wall track. And the reason for that is because Mocha actually holds out top shapes from the shapes beneath them. So every time you put a layer in the layer pile at the top, Mocha treats that object like it's closest to the camera. This is user defined. It is a feature and not a bug, you know, so if you put a larger shape over a smaller shape, it will keep the smaller shape from tracking. So make sure that you pay attention to that. Anyway, when you start tracking, it will hold it out. And that's um, a very powerful feature that you should know about. When we also track, we want to talk a little bit about what parameters we are tracking. Now, we track translation, we track scale, you know, and we track rotation. Okay, excuse me, rotation. There we go. Rotation. All right, so what do those mean? Well, we all know what translation, scale, and rotation mean. Translation's position, scale is obviously the size, and rotation is the rotation, but shear and perspective mess people up. What are shear and perspective? So shear is like a square becoming a diamond. Excuse me, let's just hit, where is it? Shear is a square becoming a diamond, and the uh, perspective tool is the addition of that motion in Z space. So what we're going to do is we're going to track translation, scale, rotation, shear, and perspective. And the reason we're going to do that is because this object is moving in perspective. So let's go ahead and hit track forwards. And what you will see is that Mocha will track this even though it is moving forward in perspective. Now, it used to be that this surface tool would break the camera plane and Mocha would have trouble tracking this object, but that is not the case anymore. And I'm just gonna go ahead and delete these so you can see what the final track looks like down here. And what you'll notice is even if we make the surface tool very huge at the end of the shot, the beginning of the shot, so here's our surface tool and you can see it goes completely off screen. Now we totally redid the way the, uh, that Mocha thinks about the camera and that is why we are now able to do this. So it's a new feature. So for those of you that have struggled in the past with um, the surface tool breaking the camera plane, that is no longer an issue. And now we can take this and we can use this in the insert module or we can use this as a corner pin. Um, one of the things that you uh, will be interested to use in After Effects would be the uh, power pin that's available as an export and you can apply it inside the plugin um, or you can use the insert tool for this. Because we're going to use the insert tool for this, we're going to use the insert clip and we're going to select insert layer. And what that will do is that will use a layer out of my host or a node out of my host, depending on what host I'm in. So like for Nuke, your insert layer would be a node. It would be an input. Okay. Um, in After Effects, it's a layer. And in um, Avid, it's a track, okay? So it's just gonna depend on what host you're in. Um, but that is how you define your insert layer. And then your is insert layer can be loaded into your shot and you don't even have to worry about corner pins back and forth. We're gonna hit save and close. And inside of our Mocha Pro user interface, um, the plugin interface, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to our insert layer section and we're gonna make sure that we are on the layer that we want. And that's why it populates into our shot. And what we do is we use the render button. So this will, let's just go ahead and turn this off. We'll use the render button. And what render will do is render, will render this right back into our scene. Okay. And we're going to do the insert cutout so that we can add compositing to this, such as blurs or grains or whatever we need to do to make this blend within our shot. So that is how this works. So that is the, excuse me, let's just fit this into the screen. So that is perspective tracking um, with Mocha and using the insert module to apply new graffiti to the shot over graffiti that we didn't necessarily have the rights for in this shot or that the director didn't like or, you know, whatever reason you want to replace graffiti on a wall, um, including advertisements. All right. Um, are there any questions for that, guys, that I need to address? Hey, Mary. No, I think that was a, definitely a really cool, you know, introduction to Mocha and, I, you know, 
like you said, we, we did rework the engine, the actual algorithm of the planar tracker in recently to solve some of the really hard tracks where sometimes if, if you saw that surface go wonky, uh, you know, that's really been improved and that's going to, those improvements trickle down to all the modules in Mocha. They do, uh, and that's especially handy for the mega plate. That's correct. That's correct. There's one one question that came up was about uh, how to show the alpha while you're rotoscoping. Maybe we should we can cover that when you cover roto in a little bit. Absolutely. I'm fixing to jump right into roto. All right. Sweet. Okay. Go for it. All right. Perfect. Thanks. All right. So back. No problem. Thanks for answering me. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about roto, and um, this is actually one of Ross's shots that I have blatantly stolen. Um, and uh, what this is, is this is a rotomation shot uh, where we have done rotoscoping over a um, shot in its entirety, including things like fingernails, um, shirt details, etc. This is a very popular look for commercials and advertisements. It also was seen in A Scanner Darkly, which was another movie that used Mocha. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to take these roto shapes and we're going to make what's called rotomation, right? And the nice thing about this is you can get a lot of details for free because you can use the same tracks um, over and over and over again for new shapes, when, which that's the power of Mocha and rotoscoping. Um, also, rotoscoping in Mocha cuts your keyframes down to about a third of what you would normally use, which cuts your roto time in half. So let's just go ahead and let's click on our source clip here, and um, we can show you what that source clip looks like. We've got this lovely guy with his camera. What we're going to do is we are going to launch Mocha and this shot has already been done, but I want you to notice how many shapes are in this shot. Okay, and then I'm going to show you how to do this from scratch. Obviously, we are not going to roto this whole shot from scratch. That would be longer than we have to spend on this. But it is important to make sure that we talk about these concepts um, and show you how to do them. So let's go ahead and hit stop here. And I'm going to hide all these layers. And you can see that we can put layers into folders, which is extremely handy, um, especially when you're dealing with tons and tons of layers like we are here. So let's just go ahead and take all of these. And we're going to turn the eye off of them. Excuse me, off of them. There we go. All right. So that means we've turned visibility off for our rotoscoping tools. Now, I can either use X blinds or I can use the magnetic tool. Now for this, what we're gonna do right here is I'm going to use the um, X-Blind tool first, and then we're gonna start hooking shapes up to this. So, and I'll talk a little bit about what this is doing while we're doing it. I'm just gonna go ahead and take an oval shape, and we're gonna just draw it right around his face here really quickly. Um, we also have things like the um, area brush, if you want, an area brush will start to track layers based on how you are painting uh, details in, but that's not really necessary for this shot. Usually primitives are enough for this sort of shot. Um, we're going to track a translation scale rotation and shear, but what we are not going to track is perspective, and that's because we are doing roto. So let's go ahead and hit click track forwards. And I'll tell you a little bit about why that is. Let's turn our surface tool on so we can see what our track is doing. Excuse me. I hit the wrong surface button. Here's surface on. I accidentally hit the align to surface tool, which is very good, um, but not for what we are doing. Um, it's only good for things like set extensions. Anyway, all right, let's go ahead and hit track forwards. One of the things I want to talk about is why we are tracking shear only. When we track in perspective, um, you really only want to use perspective for things like rigid objects. For people, um, as they move back and forth, you can start to lose the track a lot more than you would on a rigid object. And that's usually because people move more organically. Same thing for animals. Um, but the reason that I like tracking shear is because you get a little bit of that perspective motion for free and it makes it a little bit easier to rotoscope. But when you're using perspective, um, what can happen is your shape can collapse in on itself because the uh, plane has completely turned around because of how much data you're tracking. And that's just not very helpful for anyone. So I tend to tell people when they are rotoscoping, humans or animals or other organic objects that are moving organically is the key word, okay? Um, you want to use shear instead of perspective. Now, I'm not going to track this whole scene, but I am going to show you a couple of things here. Let's go ahead and trim this um, to here. 
and we'll trim this to here. And you can see that I'm using the in and out points. What we can do is we can zoom in on this like this, and now we can start to roto our shot. Now I'm gonna turn my perspective off and I want to show you that we can now start to add details to the shot. So I can use my x tool and I can come in here and I can start to make some more detailed shapes like his eyebrow. And let's just sort of fake hair a little bit like this. All right, so that is a new eyebrow shape and I kind of like the way that looks. Um, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna call this face track only spelled right, there we go. Um, and we're gonna call this eyebrow roto one. Okay, so here's our eyebrow roto. What we're gonna do is we're gonna select our eyebrow roto layer and then under our layer properties, we're going to select link to track and we're gonna select face track M. And so now our eyebrow is linked to our face track. And all of that roto that we um, would normally have to do by hand is gotten for mostly free. Okay, and I can do the same thing for the eye. So we're going to come in here. And let's say I want to give him some little rotomation eyelashes. You know, we're going to do a little bit of symbolic eyelashes. They don't have to be perfectly accurate. All right, and now I want to show you something else cool. We can select all of these points right here and we can just relax on the x-spline for a curve. With Mocha, you pull tight for corners and you relax for curves. And that is how x-splines work. We have Beziers if you want to use them. They're right here. Some people really prefer them. I really don't. Um, and the reason I don't is because when you try to move stuff in perspective, um, it doesn't always look right to me. Um, also, when you try to adjust all the handlebars at the same time, it doesn't quite work right. Whereas if you want to adjust a whole bunch of um, points at once in Mocha, just like this, it sort of reacts in a more predictable way, if that makes sense. So that is why I prefer X-Blinds over Bezier's. Your mileage may vary, okay? So we've got this eyelash. We're going to call this eyelash roto one and again we're going to link that right to, excuse me link that right to our face track and you can see we kind of get that for free but notice that we're zoomed in okay now that we're zoomed in um if we try to scroll through our timeline we end up with our our object kind of moving across the screen in a way that makes it hard to tell what the roto shape is doing so we're going to use this tool right here called quick stabilize mode what that will do is that will just pin Mocha right um, to the track. And now we can make sure that our roto is moving accurately. And I can see that it's actually not. I want this to come down a little bit, just like this. I want to bring this up. And I want to take these eyelash shapes a little bit. And I want to kind of move them, let's see, just a little bit this way and out. Okay. And what that will do is now we have an animation between those two points based on our track. And what's nice about it is because our track is nice and accurate, we get a really smooth motion for free. So let's go ahead and turn our auto stabilize mode off. And so here is our nice roto shape. So let's talk about how to view those mats. All right. So if you want to view your mats while you're rotoscoping, let's just select these two. You can do it in a couple of different ways. So you can um, go ahead and turn your mats on right here, um, or you can turn the mats on here, or you can view them with the alpha as well. So you can switch between all of these tools and you can also um, see how they work together and you can colorize the layers depending on what your needs are. So if you need to colorize your mat, like let's say I want to make Let's say I want to export this just out of Mocha as a, let's go to file and let's go to export rendered shapes. Um, let's say I wanted to do this by matte color and I could do all my visible layers by matte color and I didn't want to bring this into After Effects or any host. I just wanted to render out Rotomation in big, bold colors. Um, I could. I could actually come in here and pick a nice eyebrow color. Let's, let's make it red. I don't know. And uh, let's pick an eyelash color and let's make that... Uh, like black, okay? And now we have two different matte colors 
for our eyebrow and our eyelash. And when we render this out, it will be those colors. So there's a lot of things you can do with mats. You can either um, view the mat uh, in your interface. You can um, adjust the mat with uh, color changes over here. And you also have control over edge values. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, in your selection tool, uh, you have the option to pick both points, pick the edge, or pick the inner point. So we do um, edge feathering inside of Mocha. If we pick both, it moves both of these together. But if we pick the edge, we can pull this out. And what we end up with is a feathered mat based on our tracks. So now if we just scroll through our scene, you can see that that is feathered where his eyebrow ends. And you can make all sorts of really cool effects with this. You can do shading with this. Um, there's a lot of uh, very interesting applications that you can have with adding edge feathering, not to mention just the compositing tasks of when you need to blend something in, you need edge feathering. And sometimes you need per point edge feathering and we can do that. Now, the other cool thing about edge feathering is it does animate. So if we use our auto key tool and let's go scroll to the end of our scene, I can create like a new edge feather here and let's just pin this right back in the middle so we can see what we're doing. And you can see that animates between those two points. Now, if I use Uber key to do that, and let's say I just like feathered this out here for some reason, like we're giving him crazy makeup, um, you'll notice that that does a ripple offset throughout the shot based on the track. Okay, so that's the difference between Uber key and auto key. Now, let's see, have I covered everything about Roto? Um, is there anything y'all want it, to add? Let's uh, think about it for a second. You're covering quite a lot. Now, I love that you're just covering, you know, definitely this is a great example where you're like doing one track, but using multiple shapes to link to, you know, mm -hmm. take, taking advantage of the power of tracking and linking. Um, I, I also think you just showed a lot of like very small ways to edit the shapes, whether, you know, using the bounding box and rotating and skewing and things like that. All great tips to pick up, you know, because ultimately what we're, we're trying to do is save you time, right? right. Um, let's think, are, are you going to cover the uh, the area brush in this example or in a few, another example? Um, I talked about the area brush, but I didn't really go yeah. over it in detail. Um, so if it you might, want to use the area brush, yeah, I can. Sorry, it. It, it might be worth talking a little bit about magnetic brush with the detail settings and the area brush with the, um, there's a setting, I forget what it's called. It's the uh, smoothing, I think, value. Yeah, perfect. I can talk about that. So um, the area, yeah, no problem. So the area brush that we talked about um, a little bit, uh, I can talk more about, uh, let's just go ahead and click here. Okay. So the area brush is a tool and what it does is it allows you to paint in areas that you want to track. Um, for things like background objects, this can be really nice. So for instance, if I wanted to track this background shape, but I didn't want to draw a complex shape here, I could come in here and take my area brush tool. And now we're going to just paint right over this. And we'll just fill in the detail a little bit too. All right, so now we can say, hey, um, I want you to create a quick mask based on this. And let's turn our matte overlays off because they're looking a little bit weird. Um, all right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take this shape and what we can do is we can adjust the, um, the smoothing on this if we like, um, if it will allow us to now that we're out of quick mask mode, uh, it won't. Um, yeah, there we go. So we can either do uh, fill gaps, uh, which is actually what I think Ross was talking about, not smoothness, because that's something else. Uh, okay, so fill gaps. If you want to fill the gaps in, what you can do is you can adjust this value um, higher or lower, and the higher that is, the more it will try to fill in gaps for you. Um, if the lower this number is, uh, it will not try to fill in gaps for you. So that's the difference in fill gaps. Um, and uh, we were referring to that as smoothness. We were incorrect, sorry. Um, let's go ahead and delete that. But, so I wouldn't have had to do the, uh, the blending in that I did, but um, I tend to think it's a little bit faster to, to do that sometimes. Um, all right, so we could also use this to, you know, come in and grab these details here, just like this. And of course, if we were going to track, excuse me, of course, if we were going to track this, the other issue that we would have um, are, is this hand here. And I'm just gonna go ahead and delete these points. Um, and this hand would be in the way. So let's talk a little bit about the magnetic tool. So I had showed you the magnetic tool earlier, but the magnetic tool actually has the ability to, let's just go ahead and draw a big shape around this hand. Um, 
Now, normally I don't recommend drawing a big shape around this, a hand, you know, because of the way objects move. Because his hands are really still, uh, we don't have to think about how the um, planes are interacting with one another. So we can just draw a big, a big shape around this hand. All right. So once I have my shape drawn, I can select this and in my, uh, my, excuse me, my magnetic tool, let's just, excuse me. There we go. Let's undo this. In my magnetic tool, I can work on smoothing on this. And the nice thing about detail is we can just take the detail down and it will take the amount of points that we're using um, in our spline down. So if we are using a lot of little points and we want those points gone because we don't want to add a whole lot of heaviness to our roto shape, we can take the detail down in order to take our spline points down. And that's why you would use detail. So in area brush, Fill gaps makes it to where you can make broader strokes and have those filled. And the detail um, in magnetic spline allows you to take the detail down in your spline. All right. So when you are all done with something like this, you can hide your face track or you can put it in its own little filter. Um, and then you can link all of your face um, layers to that track. So if I were going to finish my face layer here, this is what it would look like. Those are all my face layers, and they're all linked to one track, okay? Um, that is the power of Mocha. So we get a whole bunch of shapes for free that we wouldn't normally get for free. We'd have to do by hand individually. Um, I have a friend who teaches uh, rotoscoping over at Nomon, and what he likes to do is he likes to teach people how to rotoscope from scratch, and then he teaches them how to rotoscope in Mocha, and the students are always like, why didn't you show us this first? You know, and the answer is, well, you should know the principles of animation before you dive in into uh, hooking animation up to a track. But uh, I have found that once I started rotoscoping in Mocha, probably ooh, like 12 years ago now, 11 years ago now, um, what I found was I didn't go back to rotoscoping by hand ever because this cut my rotoscoping time in half by cutting my keyframes down to about a third of what we would normally use. All right, that's rotoscoping. Um, and then to put this into After Effects, we exported or applied our shape data. Um, inside of After Effects, what you can do is you can, thank you for auto-saving um, uh, After Effects. What you can do is you can either apply your masks right here inside of the, um, the Mocha Pro interface. So you can either create mats right here by viewing the mat, or you can apply the mat. Um, and that will uh, use this like a plugin, and what we'll do, it will, it will render your mats from um, Mocha onto your timeline. But the other cool thing is Create AE Masks, and what Create AE Masks will do is that will allow you to just basically like copy and pasting your masks into the native After Effects um, file type. So there you go. Let's move on. Do y'all have anything Yeah, no, we're good to go, Mary. Yeah, no, I think uh, everyone, some people are just really positive comments. People are following along and, uh, you know, people are getting a lot from this. So let's keep going. Wonderful. Let's go. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about removes before I talk about mega plates. Um, removes are our bread and butter. Uh, well, other than screen inserts, which are, you know, another bread and butter sort of interface that, uh, that Mocha does. But... Mocha is used by and large for screen inserts and for things like uh, object placement, but what we also get used for all the time are removes. And the nice thing about removes is I'm removing a watch here from this scene. Um, but what we're doing is we're taking planar data and we are replacing that planar data with a clean plate. If you can see behind the object, Mocha can actually remove the object completely from the scene, um, as you may have seen with, uh, let's see this one um this is a, a a demo i did recently where we removed a dog from the scene with mocha um, if you can see behind the object as you can in this shot uh, we can remove the object no problem if you can't see behind the object we need a clean plate so what we're doing here is we're using a clean plate and the way that this works inside of mocha is just dead easy um, and if you are not a roto paint artist um, this this will work for you in many cases. Now, I do have to point out one of the limitations of this. Um, if you have, uh oh, open the wrong wrong software there. <laughs> if you have a um, 
if you have a clip that you're trying to remove, I want to show you how to do this in silhouette too. So just, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that and then we'll jump over to, to the uh, mega plate thing. Okay, so you can do this two different ways. You can do this in Mocha, you can do this in silhouette. Uh, silhouette uses Mocha tracks and you can use silhouette to create a clean plate if you need to without having to use Photoshop if you don't have access to it and you only have access to the Boris tools. So if you want to track this shot, um, one of the things that I tend to do um, when I'm doing a remove is I tend to draw a shape around the object that I want to remove first. And the reason for that is because when you do a remove inside of Photoshop, I mean, sorry, inside of, um, inside of uh, Mocha, what you want to do is you want to make sure that you have completely encompassed that object that you need to remove because of those holdouts that I talked about earlier. So I talked a little bit about holdout mats and why you always want to put your objects that are closest to the camera at the top of the layer pile. Um, tracking is vital for the remove module. It has to have a rock solid track. And if your foreground object that you're trying to remove is interfering with your background track, uh, Mocha is not going to be able to do a remove because what Mocha does is Mocha uses the foreground um, object and replaces all of those pixels with the tracking data from the background. All right. So we define that area first. Um, then what we want to do is we want to define the background behind the object we're trying to remove. Now, in this case, we actually have two areas that we are removing over. Now, this is a really important concept. A lot of times what people will do when they are trying to do a remove is they'll draw a shape around the object they're trying to remove and then a shape around the whole background, including multiplanar objects like arms, bodies, background trees, background further back in the background so it's moving in parallax differently okay this will not get you a successful remove unless you have very little motion in your shot and then you may be able to get away with it maybe okay but in order to do this shot what we need is we need the arm tract and the background tract okay because we are actually have pixels that break into the background and go over the arm and you can see that when you look at the shape of the object that you're trying to remove so I've already tracked this for you, but I do want to point out what these shapes look like because this is important. Okay, so here's our arm track, and you can see that it will be using all of these other pixels to try to replace the object on the watch. But what you can see is that there are not enough pixels to replace the watch with. Okay, so that's a problem. So what we can do is we can go over here to our remove. And what I like to do is I like to find where the object is most parallel to the camera. So in this in this instance, the object is most parallel to camera at the end of the scene. And we can hit create clean plate. Okay, and what that will do is that will save us a clean plate somewhere. Now, we want to make sure that we're on the object we want to remove when we do that, but I just wanted to show you how that worked. Um, when we create a clean plate, it will save that to our disk somewhere as an actual physical clean plate, okay? And we want to make sure that when we're re replacing it, that we replace it at the frame that we took it from. In this case, that frame is 199, okay? So the nice thing about this is um, once I've made my clean plate, I can load that right into Mocha. So if we want to look at what that clean plate looks like, you can see, let's turn our our mats off here. You can see that this is my clean plate that I have crudely painted. And you can see that I really overpainted the thumb over here. The reason for that is because of the perspective shift. Um, and I'm trying to get away with not having to do two uh, remove areas, which I probably would still need to do to final this shot. Um, but anyway, I overpainted the thumb area. This is really an important concept when you're doing removes, when you have to deal with um, perspective shifts. So make sure you give yourself enough to replace the object with. All right, so let's go back to our selected layer. Um, and inside of our watch layer, you can see that we have our arm track and our background track. You can also see that our arm is held out over our background. Um, when I originally tracked this background, I just want to point out, I tracked this area and then I made the shape bigger. That's important because you can see that when we um, have the shape for this background, that it actually goes much in a much larger area. All right, because I just want to make sure that I grab all of those pixels. Um, that's just a laziness thing, you know, like I just want to make sure that this watch is always, always, always inside of this background because uh, Mocha will not remove it if it doesn't have those boundaries. Now, the other thing too that I want you to notice is this foreground arm has been completely rotoed to the edge, and I mean right to the exact edge um, with our roto shape when we are doing our remove, okay, just but only where we're doing our remove. You see, we don't care where the remove doesn't cross it, but we do care 
where the remove crosses the object. So that way, when we do our remove, what we can do is we can get all of that detail contained to this area, and then the background detail will be contained to this area. So in our remove, we select our watch um, layer that we want to remove. We have our clean plate that we made in Photoshop. I'm going to show you how to do it in Silhouette too. Um, and we're going to use our clean plates exclusively. If we did not use clean plates exclusively, Mocha would just try to replace the watch pixels with more pixels of the watch from all of the rest of the frame range. Because what Mocha does is in its frame range where it searches for the pixels to replace this information with, it says the first frame of the remove is zero. The last frame of the remove is 199. I want to look 200 frames before and after. That means I'm going to look at the length of my shot to replace these pixels. Uh, 200 frames of watch is just not successful for replacing this watch. So instead, we're going to say use clean plates exclusively, and it will use the data that I gave it for this area. Okay. When you can see that behind the object, you can adjust these layers um, to do all sorts of uh, different speed increases. Okay. So 200 frames before and after is about all I ever want to do in a remove. Um, when we start getting above 200 frames before and after, depending on your machine, you're going to start slowing down, even if you're using GPU processing, just because it's really intense to ask Mocha to look at 400 frames at a time. Um, in this case, the shot is no longer than 200 frames, so it's fine. But if we had like a 2,000 range um, frame range shot, this would start to be a different um, uh, scenario. Also, if we were using, you know, 4K, 6K, 8K footage, the more uh, render intensive your remove is going to be, the more you want to take this number down um, to just enough to give you the information behind the object you're trying to replace. Same thing for step. What step does is step actually looks at every single frame, okay? And with a step of one, that's fine because we're using clean plates exclusively. Um, so we're not really looking at step, but if we were trying to replace this object um, based on what was moving behind it, we might want to look every two frames, every five frames, every 10 frames, okay? And that will start to seriously speed up our removes. So if you've ever struggled with remove render times, make sure that you look at your settings because it's probably the culprit, okay? Now, the next thing is illumination modeling. We don't need it on this shot, but if the lighting was changing over time, we could use linear illumination modeling, and that would take this entire shape. When it replaced the pixels, it would try to match those pixels uniformly in hue, saturation, and value based on lighting changes. So that's going to work for total lighting changes. But if we had things like caustics, we would use interpolate. And what that does is that blends a lighting change across the shape. It's also very render intensive. So if you don't need it, don't use it. All right, now we're going to go ahead and turn this mat off and I'm going to hit a render test. And you can see that this removes very nicely. Let's jump down here to the middle of the shot, do a render test. Still looks good to me. Let's jump to the beginning of the shot and do a render test. All right, looks good to me. Now, notice that I did not render through the whole frame range. That's because I'm trying to work quickly. We want to work smarter and not harder. Okay, so we're going to hit save and close. And now what we're going to do is in our module renders, we're going to render our remove back to our timeline just like this. And what that will do is that will now render this. Let's just go turn this off for a second. Um, that will render this back to our timeline, and we can just render this completely back to our timeline inside of our host without having to wait anymore, just by clicking Render and Remove in the drop-down menu, okay? Now, you can also render inserts that way. You can render lens distortions and undistortions that way, and you can render um, reorients for 360 and stabilizations this way. So you do not need to render out of Mocha when you're using the plugin. That's the power of using the plugin, and honestly, I have stopped using the standalone. So, because I have more compositing options this way and I don't have to do test renders every time, I can do a couple of frames of test render and then render everything out. All right, we have any questions, guys, before I move on to megaplates? Very cool example, Mary. I mean, it's it's amazing, especially for, you know, from my experience when I used to work on various compositing software or in, back in the day, you know, you did this in like one plugin, right? <laughs> one effect. Yep. Uh, and if you think of everything that you're doing there in a node graph system or in a full compositing system, you know, it's a very simple way that uh, someone who doesn't know visual effects can take on some pretty intense kinds of shots, right? Yeah. What I like about this is the multiplanar aspect of it because we've got the background and the wrist. So, and as long as your roto is correct, so will the remove be. Um, Oh, you know, I meant to touch on how to do this in Silhouette if you needed to do that instead of um, Photoshop. So can I do that real quick? 
Yeah, we might want to do that. And as you get that going, uh, you know, someone was asking about uh, how would how would you know a tricky a common tricky example that they have problems with is removing like uh, tracking markers off a reflected surface or something like that. And uh, you know, I suggested there's two ways that I would approach it. One might be with multiple clean plates or maybe silhouette paint is actually a better you know with the clone techniques or, or is a better option for something like that where when the clean shapes the clean the clean areas do not exist in the shot right yeah so for something like that that would be a planar um it would be a planar replacement right it's a planar it's a planar remove but the plane that you're you need to remove is not something that's a easily trackable or b uh really available in your shot so um what you can do is uh you can well, I, there's a third way that I, I would consider solving that too, which is taking a mocha shape um, and then subtracting it and moving the reflection over and seeing what you could get for free and using a really, really like, I mean, just crazy amount of feathering and seeing if you could get away with it, which you might be able to, or you might not, depending on the shot. Um, or I would just straight up paint it in silhouette because no thank you. Um, and also you might just be better off by cranking the values up zero to one. So you just get a, like, you know, a, a reflection that's, you know, very shades of gray and then painting that. So, um, all right. There are many ways to skin that cat. In other words, um, I, I, so I've already painted. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the delay is a killer on this. Okay, so um, I've painted this already, but I kind of want to show you how to do it. Um, if you need to paint this in silhouette, because um, uh, you don't have access to Photoshop or whatever, um, what you can do is you can paint this. And the nice thing about this um, is silhouette has a couple of really cool tools for this. So we're going to use a uh, right click to just really quickly lay in some colors. Right click will allow you to, with your paintbrush selected, um, go ahead and sample a whole area of colors. And you can just sort of start to lay colors in. Um, the reason I like to lay colors in uh, as opposed to trying to clone stuff like this is because it just cloning does not necessarily work um, for large areas of details with shadows and stuff in them. Um, the other thing about this tool is you can take softness, take it all the way up to 100, um, and you can start to adjust your brush sizes and you can really lay colors in quickly. So, you know, we'll really color cover that up just like this. And let's just take some of this color and some of this, just like that. All right, and we can also lay them in at opacity. Um, the nice thing about this too is you can use Silhouette uh, in order to uh, track in Mocha inside of Silhouette and then hook this paint up to that if you want to. Um, we can use the Blemish tool. The nice thing about the Blemish tool is I can blend all this together with like a noise over the top. So that's something we can do in Silhouette. But the other cool thing that I wanna bring to your attention is we can paint on detail. So I can just, we're using shift to drag this over. And what we're doing is just to show you, um, we're gonna use the color, instead of using the color layer, we're gonna use the detail layer because we split everything up in silhouette and color and detail. And now we can come in and we can start to paint. Let's just take this opacity all the way up to 100. We can start to paint in detail over the top, just like this. And what's nice about that is that allows us very, very quickly to get um, our color on the layer that the color is supposed to be on and our detail on the detail layer, it's like using the heel tool. So let's go to output real quick and let's show you what that looks like. So now we can just paint detail over the top and you can see like very quickly my muddy mess of like just blur paint, you know, now starts to look like something because we're using the detail brush. So now I can go back to normal. I can use the opacity down. I can take our clone tool and I can just start to blend the stuff together and very quickly, we get a decent looking paint in silhouette. So that's how you would paint this in silhouette instead of painting inside of um, After Effects. Now, I mean, not After Effects, um, Photoshop, although you could try to paint this in After Effects. I don't know that I would recommend it. Um, all right, so that is silhouette. I'm gonna just very quickly show you what the final looked like for that, which is this. And we're gonna go ahead and close silhouette. And we'll talk a little bit about mega plates um, since we've only got a little bit of time left. So, mega plates, where did you go? There you are. All right. So, um, for those of you that tuned into one of our previous webinars, uh, this may look a little bit familiar to you, but we're going to talk about this concept. Um, 
the remove technology allows us to do something really cool. Um, because we can look at the way tracks move and because we can look at the way tracks move and replace pixels based on various areas, um, what we can do is we can start to get, mm, I don't want to say matte paintings for free, but we can get the basis of a matte painting um, or any other um, usage that you would use for meta, mega plates out of, uh, out of Mocha for pretty much free. So what we're going to do is we're going to launch Mocha and I'm going to take this shot and I've, I've actually already uh, tracked this. I'm not going to make you sit through the tracking of this, but I will tell you how this was tracked. So the first thing I did, as usual, is I tracked and rotoed this foreground mountain, okay? And I did that with the X-Blind tool. I made myself like a, you know, funky little shape. And then I tracked and rotated that over time, okay? Very easy. Uh, the reason that I went ahead and made such a large area outside of the track is A, because that helps track objects like this, and B, because when I create my mega plate, I'm gonna wanna take this out of my mega plate because I'm only interested in the background information. And just like a remove, you wanna make sure that you give yourself enough area between the object you're removing and the background so that when you replace all those pixels, they'll blend seamlessly right into the background. So keep that in mind when you're doing removes and when you're doing mega plates. Um, now to track this background, all right, I'm gonna show you a really cool technique. I'm not gonna track the whole shot, but I am gonna show you the technique. Um, if we want to track this shot, Mocha has this really awesome thing that you can do. Uh, let's just go ahead and draw a little shape here. That's all we need to draw to track this because Mocha is a planar tracker and we're tracking the whole planar background. And the nice thing about um, objects that are very, very far away from the camera is that the parallax is very small, so you can treat it like a flat object. Um, like, uh, I think the one of the most recent examples was the newer Star Wars movie. Um, you know, there's a bunch of nerds on the internet saying stuff like, well, you would never be able to tell from the knife where the, the thing would be in the background. It's like, well, that's not actually true because it flats, flattens out because there's not a lot of parallax on objects that are far, far away. So we're going to use that to our example. And what we're going to do is we're going to turn our surface tool on. We're going to use the link to track and we're going to link to none. Okay. And now we're going to track translation only. Okay. Because we don't need translation scale and rotation again because that object is so far away from the camera that the parallax is very minimal and the scale is also very minimal um, because cameras work a lot like eyes work. Okay, now we're going to go ahead and hit track forward. Now what's cool about this is because we link to track none, our shape is going to stay tracking right here, but look at our surface tool. It's going to be moving right off screen. And the reason for that is because we have unlinked the track from the shape. That means the track is looking here in this shape as we track. And the surface tool is representing what the track is doing. I probably should have covered that when I was talking about planar tracking in the first place. But the shape is where the track is looking. And the surface tool is what the track is doing. A lot of times people mix up the two. They think that whatever that shape is doing is what the track is doing. But please understand that the shape can lie to you. It's not trying to. It's just the shape is not what the track is doing. Um, but the shape is a child of the track and will follow what the track is doing. The only caveat to that is that you can hand animate the shape. So many times people will hand anim animate the shape and think they are hand animating the track. No, they are not. If you need to hand animate the track, that is the purview of manual track, which we have many tutorials on, or adjust track, which look for some improvements to that coming soon, okay? Now, I'm not, again, I'm not going to make you sit through this whole thing, but suffice to say, that's our lovely track. And what we want to do is we want to make sure that when we track, let's turn our surface tool off and turn our mats off. When we track, we want to make sure that this shape is covered in the entire area we want to build our mega plate from. So you can see that this shape is covering the entire area that we are using for our mega plate. That is really, really important. Can't drive that home enough, okay? You need to make sure that the shape is where you want to um, build your mega plate. Now, if we want to tell Mocha to go ahead and put this together, what I like to do is I like to find something near the middle of the shot, okay? And the reason for that is if I find something closer to the middle of the shot or the middle of the shape even, um, our warp will be less because all cameras have a lens warp to them. If we have not solved for that lens warp, it will not be solved for in our mega plate. So we want to make sure that we have as little warping as possible. That's why I like to create a mega plate in the middle of our scene. That's the case for any type of blending that you're going to do of frames, whether you do a mega plate manually by stacking a bunch of frames together, or if you use Mocha to go ahead and do that automatically for you. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go to mega plates and we're going to say, hey, uh, go ahead and render me a mega plate. Now, mega plate is 
um, GPU accelerated, but I'm having a little bit of issues on my uh, my GPU right now. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to use CPU for this. It is going to be a little bit slower, but it's still pretty fast for what it's doing. So what it's doing is it is looking throughout the whole timeline. It's looking at our track. It's looking at every frame along that track. And then it is rebuilding pixel by pixel available in the background um, that it can see based on my holdout shape I created for the foreground and the shape I created for the background. So just like the remove tool, the shape and the track is totally vital for this process. Now, that is the same for every module in Mocha. You need to make sure that your track is rock solid and everything else in Mocha follows your track. All right, so we're going to let this process just a little bit more because it's taken a minute, but the closer it gets to the end, the faster it will go. And uh, just uh, Darren's going to jump in a second and let you know that we're getting very close to the end of our time. So maybe while that's finishing up, Brendan, or I don't know, Brian, if you want to pop on and mention sure. who's next and any details. Oh, there you go. Sorry. Yeah. Just trying to fill yeah, this so last funny. bit of content with yeah. what we can because we are very close to the end of our uh, hour. Absolutely. Um, um, so the the only other thing would we do we would do here is we would hit remove um, remove foreground, and what that would do is that would uh, go ahead and take our foreground right out of the scene for us. So that's mega plates, and uh, take it away, Brian. Um, very cool. Don't want to shortchange mega plates because it is it is probably my favorite new feature. It's very cool. Um, feature. Very cool. Very cool. Um, um, let's announce the Boris Effects um, winner. Um, who won the Boris Effects suite? Congratulations to Taj Jackson. Um, Taj has won 12 months of everything we make. So that's Sapphire, Continuum, Mocha, Silhouette, um, and Optics. So very cool. Congratulations to Taj. Um, coming up after um, Mary's presentation, coming up next on Boris Effects, we have two more great presentations. Um, at 1.30 on the West Coast, 4.30 on the East Coast, we're going to go over um, and hang out with Brendan O'Neill from Bonfire, who's going to show us how he uses Unreal along with Flame um, to finish um, his commercials that they work on at Bonfire. Um, and then following Brendan to close out the day today at 6 o'clock on the East Coast and 3 o'clock on the West Coast, we're going to um, hang out with John Dickinson, who's going to show us all of the new features coming in Particle Illusion 2021, including support for 3D cameras. So really cool to tune in um, to the two more presentations today. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, I always learn so much watching, and today was no exception. So um, always enjoy watching your work. So great job. Thank you, Mary. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you, Ross. Thank you, Mary. Um, and we will be back, everybody, in a half an hour um, to um, hang out with Brendan from Bonfire and check out some Unreal and Flame. So please come back and join us um, in a half an hour. All right. We'll see you all then. Thank you. Thanks, guys. All right. Bye. <laughs>